Welcome to the Libertarian Crusaders episode podcast number 33. And today we have the great Bill Ottman. I've seen him a lot in many other social media outlets, uh, Fox News, I think CNN, right? So you have an interesting audience in terms of uh, bringing an alternative. People are always kind of looking for an alternative to Facebook. You know, what's the Facebook killer? And you've created an interesting alternative called Minds. You're the CEO of Minds. Could you speak a little bit what Minds is about? Sure, yeah. Minds is an open source social network dedicated to internet freedom, transparency, privacy, helping creators earn for their contributions. So we reward crypto tokens. We have an Ethereum based token that we reward to everybody for the engagement that they create. So it's sort of meritocratic in that sense. And one token gives you a thousand views. So you can actually use the token that you earn to boost your posts and get more exposure on your posts. And we did that sort of in reaction to all of the algorithms that are restricting people's reach on the other networks. We're like, so they're, they're suppressing people's reach. We want to amplify it. And, you know, then we also have fiat payout options. So we're trying to help people earn you know, regular money as well. And, you know, from, you know, we support video blogging messenger. Um, you know, we're trying to do, cause a lot of what the big networks do is, is smart. I mean, you know, they built pretty amazing communication tools, but they're totally inaccessible to really understand if they're respecting the users. So the design is amazing. You know, that's why most of us are still like partially addicted. I'm not claiming to be, you know, fully (laughs) on the wagon. Um, but I've extracted a lot of it from my life. Like I I don't have a Facebook or, you know, I don't have accounts on them, but I, I do find myself using like Google occasionally and it's hard. It's hard not to. Right. Uh, I think DuckDuckGo is an interesting alternative, but doesn't have like the, uh, the reach in terms of uh, search uh, return results as Google. I did change my default mobile search to DuckDuckGo actually like probably like six months ago. And I mean, it, it usually gets you what you need. Right. right. If you, it gets you the basic results. It's not as advanced, but it's never going to get as advanced if we don't use it. Because they need our energy. If we don't give them our energy, then they're never going to grow big enough to where they can get competitive. So that's that's the kind of the paradox. That was one of the questions I wanted to ask is uh, you said open source in the beginning. And uh, I was curious what that means to you. And uh, like when you open source something like an idea and the community can be involved in it, maybe you can't get down there and look at the code and understand what's going on. but you can be a signal boost to people who can do it and, you know, like really look into what a, a platform is doing for you or shadow banning you or using nefarious techniques to keep you addicted, things like this. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, <clears throat> whether software is open source is not really relevant to 99% of people who are using a product. It's more just the principle. And yeah, I, I, I haven't heard it put like that, but that a signal boost is, is a great way to put it because if enough people are using it and saying, hey, this is, this is open source, then you know the, the cybersecurity experts are gonna be able to go in there and they're gonna want to go in there. So they have incentive too, because more people are gravitating towards it. So it uh, increases their value they get out of it also. Yeah, I mean, typically the smartest developers in the world all really care about open source, end-to-end encryption, you know, different types of of data privacy. And um, so, you know, realistically, some of them get tempted by the big, to go work for the big tech companies, but now more and more, especially in like the crypto industry, there's tons of, of for, you know, lucrative opportunities for ethical development. You know, it's, it, it used to be more so that 
you kind of had to pick between like being poor and principled or, you know, make a ton of money and like sell your ideas to the devil. But now there's a ton of money getting pumped into the, into this movement. So that, that's good. It's still going to take a while to catch up. This is called being a libertarian. (laughs) (laughs) So there's like, you know, libertarians, like we talk about free speech all the time. And, uh, yet that means I think different things to different people, depending on as it relates to social media, because I mean, Trump just came out with this social media executive order, um, where he said, this is to defend free speech from one of the gravest dangers that is faced in American history. He said the, uh, small hand, small handful of social media companies, um, have unchecked power to censor, restrict, edit, shape, hide, or alter virtually any form of communication between private citizens and large public audiences. And I think to some degree, I, I totally agree with him, but I don't know that I want, I, I don't know whether I want the government to establish itself as this um, arbiter of what's free speech and what's not in this context. Well, they sort of already have. I mean, it seems like, and I haven't super deeply analyzed it, I need to this weekend, but You know, we have Section 230 right now, and it's not really getting enforced. So, because there's, it actually uses the language, you know, good faith, um, you know, in terms of like moderation practices that that networks have to abide by. And it, it pretty clearly seems that, well, one, I mean, Twitter, sort of falsely advertised and so did so did a lot of the big networks because they they initially were open to a way wider variety of content than they are now you know back in the day on twitter right. facebook youtube maybe not some facebook's always been heavily restrictive but i mean you could it was all <laughs> there yeah and no one was really complaining about it it was just you know probably just because it hadn't been dug up but it was much more of a of, of a wild west, and now everybody is so hyper vigilant about speech and you know what's offensive today um, that Twitter and you know they've all locked down further. But you know that and yeah, they have the right to change their terms. And, and so I totally see the debate. I mean, you know, does Twitter have the right to do what? they want to do but it it comes down to section 230 and do they deserve immunity from user generate liability of user generated content if they are acting like a publisher and so if if what what the executive order seems to do is bring in government help to enforce 230 which already exists so it's like you and now he tweeted today, get rid of 230. So I don't know, you know, it's, it's really complicated. Yeah. Right. This goes down to the issue of, um, you can say copyrights or defamations, these kind of uh, lawsuits that can arise from that. And, you know, you, it's, uh, they think that you're in some way violating someone's property rights if you say something mean to them uh, or you say something negative. And as a result, uh, in this section that they created, uh, provide some kind of immunity that they're not recognized as a publisher. You're not responsible for like, if someone were to use your forum and were to share copyrighted content, uh, the publisher itself being also held liable for that. Um, and yeah, I, I think, uh, that's kind of ridiculous. That's a free speech issue. You should be able to say whatever you want to say, but of course, you know, these agencies should also be able to say, we don't want to hear what you want to say on our platform. Uh, so it kind of goes both ways. Um, and then us as consumers can see, you know, which one seems to be more uh, in line with allowing more freedom of discussion. Um, how, do, how, how is it that you think that, uh, like you have Facebook, you have Twitter, you have Reddit, these conglomerates have been kind of, are very leftist uh, in terms of their standards of uh, restrict, like, like getting involved in a lot of these other social medias. Now, how come like conservatives or, anyone else far uh, right from that left um, haven't been able to uh, keep up or establish like their own social networks. I isn't there already a, a social, a mainstream social network that, you know, happens to have more of a conservative leadership. 
Um, you know, the odd thing is that if you actually look at Facebook, um, Peter Thiel is on their board. I mean, he voted for Trump. Mm. Uh, you know, he's a conservative, pretty much libertarian type guy. And then, you know, there's like heavy duty capitalists on the board of Facebook, but their content policy is what their content policy is. So, but there's obviously disagreement there. And I'm sure that there's left, there's heavy left influence on Facebook. And it seems like that is the force that it seems to be driving their content policy. Um, Even with... Right. And search results in terms like they, they're, they would hide or change the algorithm to kind of redirect people to where they would want them to find and see instead. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've always wondered why like Fox news or Fox or, you know, any of the conservative like traditional news media outlets never went in the direction of, I mean, well, yeah, of building, social networks i mean you know you look at what what legacy media is is clearly lagging behind the social networks i mean the social networks are much more powerful than any individual media outlet msnbc cnn fox you know both sides of the spectrum now you know those are multi-billion dollar companies like you know could they put 25 million bucks into building out a a serious social network so that you know, they can start to harness the power of the crowd and, and, and be just more of a, of a portal for, for information. You know, none of them have, have made that move, which to me has always been surprising, surprising because I mean, we've been able to bootstrap a social network with, you know, fairly limited resources and we're growing really quickly. So, you know, maybe they just don't feel like dealing with it. It's not their model, but you know, at the end of the day, media outlets want to, you know, you would think that they would, you know, they want eyeballs, they want users, they want to understand what's going on in the world. So yeah, who knows? That's, that's sort of a mystery. And I think that realistically, there is going to emerge, like we were saying, I mean, whether it's a conservative one or just a a non-political one, which doesn't play politics. I mean, that's more of what we are. We're not like the, you know, we're not, we're not left or right. We're not, that, that I think would be a mistake to establish ourselves um, on one side of the political spe- spectrum. Around. That would limit the, the discourse. So, you know, we try not to inject our personal politics in, into the platform. I noticed that there's always a, like a scare every now and then on various networks like uh sometimes on facebook everybody's like oh crap um you know they're they're cracking down (laughs) and uh so all of a sudden like we're all getting we're we're all getting on all the other um like you know all the free speech uh social networks you know and mine's is one of the first ones i got onto and you know and and you realize like that shouldn't be like it, it, you know, you should just go on to mines all the time. If that's, if that's what you have to do, or that's what you feel you have to do anytime there's a scare. Mm-hmm. And so it seems like, um, that, you know, I, what do you think about that, that idea of, of people I getting think about that a lot, man. I mean, you know, yeah, there'll be a big censorship event or like some huge invasion of privacy or whatever it is, some big abuse of, uh, of big tech companies and that everyone start screaming ironically on the mainstream social networks. Oh my God, like Facebook, you suck. I'm, you know, it'll, it'll be like Facebook is dead trending on Facebook or like Twitter is dead <laughs> trending. On Twitter. Like, okay, people like, are you having fun complaining about it over there? And then, you know, people go sign up and they'll check it out. And then, you know, three days later they'll be back and that, you know, they won't be staying active. And, you know, I understand that to a certain degree because the critical mass are on those big networks. And so people feel like that's where more of the conversation is. So, and not to mention the products are very advanced. So, you know, we're still playing catch up with regards to some of the, some of the features that people are used to. We're getting closer. Um, you know, with, we just did a big release uh, this month, which was a big upgrade to just the overall UX and navigation. And we have huge upgrades coming in 
like all throughout the next quarter and like constantly basically. But you know, people are addicted and they, it's like where the, the networks, it's where their groups are. It's where their communities are. And migrating those communities without invading everybody's privacy is actually really hard. Part of the reason we haven't hit crazy critical mass, which I think we probably would be 10, 20 times bigger right now if we had been using kind of the dirty tactics of like reaching into everybody's contact books. You know, this is what they did to grow. They, 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 I think the guy's name was Boz or something at Facebook who there were some leaked memos of his that were just so ruthless and talking about, you know, we're going to do all anything at, at all costs. We grow, we get all data. We, we get access to everybody's stuff. We, 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 you know, bomb all of their contacts, just totally unashamed growth. Um, and that's just what they all did. That was the status quo. And because we're not willing to do that, it makes our job even that much harder. It's already hard enough, but not being willing to do that makes it way harder. So, but it's just, a, it's a patience game. I think that ultimately the principal platforms and networks are going to be the ones that, you know, they're going to be the only option. So it's, it's a long game. Right. People would say like, uh, Facebook stole my data. All my stuff is getting lost. You know, I don't like the way that they're targeting me. It's like, but mine's never did that to me. Mine's always treated me well. Mine's always been there for me. Um, don't you think maybe you sh so you're saying you shouldn't go and break into a uh, local university servers and databases and get their pictures and, uh, fulfill it kind of like the Zuckerberg movie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Who would oh, no, that's on our roadmap, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I feel a lot of people took Tom for granted uh, from MySpace. Uh, I used to have a MySpace. Um, and I was going to ask, uh, in terms of information, uh, you guys don't really take a lot of information, right? What's uh, the policy with mines with uh, the different... They don't require it. Don't require it, okay. No one, no one has to identify themselves. You have the right to be anonymous. I think that's really important. Um, and we're definitely not taking it without consent, but you know, the reality is that the way that social networks operate is with data. I mean, you, you are creating data trails everywhere you go. You're, you're interacting with things, you're bookmarking things, you're, you know, like it, you're voting on things, you're commenting, you're sharing, like all of that is creating data. So we're not anti-data. We're, we don't, put it this way, there's personal sensitive data, which we don't even try to have access to and certainly don't require people give to us. But then there's public data. So you have stuff that, you know, you post, you have, you know, people that you follow. And currently, we actually don't have the option to have like a private account. Um, and we haven't, done that yet because we don't want to like offer it and have it be not real. You know, like Facebook will say, Oh, you can make your account private. It's not private. It's, you know, it's sort of hidden, but it's not, it's not actually private. So we, um, you know, if it's public information, then, you know, it is public. And if it's personal, then yeah, obviously, we, we, we try to not even give ourselves access to that information. So, um, and, and we're, but, but yeah, data is just a really complex subject, but we certainly like would never sell it. And it's, we're, we're trying to give people as much access and control over the data that they bring as possible and go beyond that and actually pay people for, you know, the, uh, traffic and energy that they, that they bring to the network. I remember at the beginning of uh, Facebook, I mean, I, I signed up in 2004 and when I was in college and um, I remember it was, it was very interesting because it was just us. It was just young college students and there was a huge limit on the number of people. And then eventually like they let your parents come on or something. And I thought some of the exclusivity of it was lost. And um, I don't understand why it's still doing so well, given the fact that it's not, it, it's not exclusive. There's, there's not like a, and you know, I don't necessarily always want, um, everybody in the world seeing what I'm posting. I do want like my community to see what I'm posting. And too often it seems too easy for, um, 
it, you know, it's a minefield really of, of navigating that. So the, the privacy aspect, I think like the, everybody knows like the data you want to share and the data you, you clearly don't. And, uh, they, they kind of blur the lines between the two, it seems. Yeah. I mean, <sighs> They needed to go beyond the colleges in or, in order to scale, um, you know. So, and now they own Instagram and WhatsApp, and I think Instagram is where is is honestly sort of their their foundation now, because most people don't even really realize that it's Facebook, and even if they do realize, they just like try to forget about it because it's like pretty pictures and and whatnot. And it, honestly, it is Instagram is a beautifully designed app. It is one of the better designed apps out there. The founders left because of privacy issues. Um, they were, and so did the WhatsApp founder. Basically every founder from a company that Facebook acquires ends up leaving. So, I, yeah, I mean, I don't, it, I, I don't know what, I, I don't think they're gonna be able, they're gonna become irrelevant in the same way that MySpace did. I don't think it's really possible at this point because they've embedded themselves into society so deeply into everybody's website so deeply people have put so much effort into them like orders of magnitude beyond what they put into myspace so you know google twitter facebook ultimately i don't see them just disappearing if anything it's going to be they're going to have to change in, in order to stay relevant and probably come more towards the, the freedom side of things. I mean, even if you just look at how Zuckerberg was criticizing Dorsey over how they were handling the fact checking recently, it's like, well, first of all, that's BS. It's like, Zuckerberg, are you really trying to act like you're like pro free speech or something like it's it's like Stalin criticizing Mao. I mean, like, <laughs> what are you doing? So, yeah, they they they. It's a lot of uh, lip service. You know, Dorsey tries to act like he's you know all principled about Bitcoin and like love and really likes crypto. And Zuckerberg talks about decentralization. They try to launch Libra, and it's just it would be. I don't know if, if any of these networks would just walk the walk, they would honestly make our job really hard hmm. because we wouldn't be as necessary if one of them would just do it the right way. Right. I think like we're talking like, what would it take for Facebook to tank? Like maybe to reveal that Zuckerberg, it really is a lizard man. Um, <laughs> that would help. <laughs> I don't think it's possible. I hate to say it. I think they, I, I, they, they can lose ground. They have, you know, when it's click to log in with your Facebook credentials and stuff like that, it's pretty hard for people to separate from that. When they have apps that are bloatware that you can't uninstall and then, you know, contracts with the manufacturers, you know, that's, a, that's some roots that are sunk pretty deep. So that's, that's what I'm saying, man. Exactly. They have, they have, con you know, they're in your TV, they're in your phone, they're in, you know, those are contracts. Those are, those are tentacles that are latched. But on and, the other side, I see the pendulum kind of swinging because I do see some hardware manufacturers with like hardware shutoffs to microphones and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. people tend to want to find solutions, but it tends to be more of a, a niche sort of solution. Well, afterwards. if that start, let's, let's imagine that happening. Imagine there's just the scandal of all scandals. I mean, you know, Zuckerberg or Dorsey or, you know, Sergey Brin and Larry, like watching, you know, turning on someone's camera and watching them. And it's like all, you know, Project Veritas finds it out, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and it's just storms the internet and everyone's like, boycott Facebook, boycott all big tech. And all the manufacturers start saying, oh, we're ripping out the, we're, we're ripping up the contracts. Everyone's like, I'm taking the, the little buttons off my website. Everybody is just getting, you know, hemorrhaging it out of their system. They will just pivot at that point and like 
maybe even step they you know executives step down and they make you know they'll make drastic changes they'll start giving more to the community to you know that that will be the pressure to come more towards where we are mm -hmm. and so you know maybe they'll just go down with the ship and 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 not not change anything but i tend to think that even though there are a lot of ignorant people there there's there's a lot of really smart people there too and i i don't think that they will let that happen that being said i still think regardless what we're going to see is you know a group of alternative social networks rise up to be fully competitive with the facebook's google and twitter you know in like a hopefully in 10 years it's like you know maybe us and like a, a handful of others if 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 we're you know if we can keep it up where it will be sort of like a clear option you know right now we're still sort of on the edge and um, you know most people don't know about us and you have to be pretty pretty aware to do, to dig deep enough to to find the alternatives most people just aren't bothered with it all right uh but you can't say like sometimes people think well you know first movers have like great advantage in establishing themselves and creating these contracts but the first movie mover was uh myspace and they got overtaken uh, the first moving mover for, I would say, search engines was uh, Yahoo. Yahoo was like the go-to place for search engines before Google came out of nowhere and overtake it. I was more of an Alta Vista guy myself, but I mean, what you know, whatever. You know, whichever <laughs> one. It is possible, but uh, I mean, like Kurt was saying, the none of those sites had tentacles as deep, you know, particularly when it comes to like the APIs, because and even the frameworks, like if you look at, like for instance, actually one of the good things that Facebook and Google do, like Google um, helps ha created Angular, which is an open source programming framework, uh, front end programming framework that we actually use, um, and you know it's totally open source and it's it, it has a huge developer community and you know every open source i mean re, facebook does react facebook does react native i mean those are totally open source projects that so they know that they have they know open source works and so what they do is they create more like base layer tools um databases programming programming languages um and you know tool sets because they know they need the developers on their side so right now they're playing the game of we keep the you know all the sexy stuff private proprietary closed and all this stuff that is like foundational to the the internet we're gonna make open so and they're both playing that game so because they know and, and that it, it seems to be well because you're never gonna get the developers of the world to contribute to proprietary frameworks. It's, it's not in anybody's interest. So they're, they're, they're aware of this dynamic and, you know, to be honest, they're probably predicting it. Hmm. I, well, you see it, Microsoft's, they bought GitHub. So exactly. people have had to migrate off of GitHub and you know, uh, it, it makes for a more decentralized kind of like system that we're building that we can leverage for our ends. But yeah, it gets polluted in so many ways and you always have to jump puddle to puddle to puddle. It's, it's nonstop. Microsoft used to be so anti-open <clears throat> source. They were the ultimate anti-open source company. And now all of their marketing is like, Microsoft loves Linux with little emojis and they bought GitHub. <clears throat> we're on GitLab. <clears throat> I'm on GitLab too, yeah. Nice. GitLab where it's at, <clears throat> is where it's at. They have a they, you know amazing company, totally spearheading distributed workforce movements, open sourcing like policy docs, you know all their code. It's it's just I love working with GitLab, and you know companies like GitLab and WordPress prove that open source can be profitable as well. So I think that. The, you know, and the big companies know, are looking at that, you know, they're, they're acquiring some of these companies in, in, in certain cases. So they know that it's viable. 
And it just seems like they're predicting that, you know, they can, they can control the market better by keeping it closed for now. I, I would not be surprised if, if one of them ultimately opened something up. Like WordPress actually just bought Tumblr. Wow. It changed Which, hands a couple times recently, didn't it? Yeah. Tumblr got bought by uh, Yahoo. And then I think Verizon bought them for some ridiculously low price. And then now WordPress got them for like basically nothing because Verizon was like in, incompetent. But I mean, Tumblr is a huge social network. And I, I would not be surprised if in the next like year we heard that, that WordPress open, opened up the Tumblr source code. Have you looked into federating at all or? Yeah, no, we're doing, we're going to be doing it in Q3 uh, and people are, are pissed at us for not doing it sooner. Um, but yeah, we're going to be doing activity pub, which is what Mastodon and diaspora use. So definitely excited for activity pub that's coming. And then, yeah, we're also looking at like publishing content to other types of distributed systems so that you can publish it both to our servers and then where you can delete it, or you can publish it to like distributed systems, torrent style networks, or maybe some certain types of new blockchains that can handle content. But in that case, you can't delete it. So there's a whole rabbit hole of issues that come with that. How is, uh, I, I think a lot of the issues a lot of people have, like trying to find uh, new social media stuff right now is like uh, encryption. Uh, can you tell us a little about the uh, encryption features that uh, Minds has? Yeah, we have encrypted Messenger. It's honestly, we're ripping it out and, and we're, we're going to be replacing it with uh, Matrix protocol. So the Matrix protocol, um, there's it powers a handful of, of end-to-end -end encrypted messaging apps, but it's really amazing. They've come a long way. I, now Mozilla is using them for their in, internal and like support messaging. I think Wikimedia is going to launch something with them. Um, Riot, which is a pretty cool, uh, feder it's federated as well. Uh, the Matrix protocol, so you can actually it's end-to-end -end encrypted, and you can also message with people not only on Minds but on other nodes as well from the same messenger. So we're excited to do that. But yeah, I mean, we encrypt all, you know, everything that we can and it's, uh, yeah, it's just a constant battle because, you know, even like signal gets a lot of beef it signals an open source encrypted messenger, which is, which is really good. But like they, you know, you can really never win with, the, the the hardcore privacy people, which I would consider myself one of, and that's why it's it's been really hard for us to to grow because <laughs> we're sort of working against ourselves. But like people criticize Signal just because you have to use a phone number to sign up, um, and you know I don't know. You're it, it's if the world wants freedom, um, then it's going to have to wait. I think, <laughs> and be patient. <laughs> right. Like how do you, how do you sign in? Because you like, I know you can uh, use the thumbprint or something probably eventually someday or uh, use your face. I know you can do it with a phone, but um, there's gotta be some kind of unique identifier that is not directly tieable to, in any easy way, you know, to each individual, but yeah, I mean, we're also looking at uh, distributed identity systems and, you know, using key pairs of like, so, you know, on Minds, you have, a, you have an address and key for your wallet, which and we use MetaMask, where you can, you know, hold Ethereum and a bunch of other tokens. And then, you know, you also have Messenger keys. And so... Realistic, I, I, I think where distributed identity is going is kind of, you, you know, you, you carry your keys with you and you can kind of log into different systems with, with common sets of keys. But, you know, then there's tons of competition in that market as well. So it's like everyone's trying to come up with the new distributed identity system. And it's like, well, you know, because cr creating standards and common, common protocols is it's just, it's really hard. It's, it's, it's because there's even competing standards. So, um, 
yeah, we just have to take our best guess at, at, at what's going to work. But I do think that we will start to see new standards emerge where, yeah, people have their sets of keys for their, you know, privacy and that handle their, their crypto wallets and their, their, uh, encrypted messenger and that sort of your, and you can attach different kinds of identity data to that. And you sort of carry that around with you and you can log into different, different networks with that. Uh, some of the stuff that you're creating here, I love it. I have a mines account. Um, so I'm very familiar with, uh, with the way it works. Um, but I think I got it like maybe, what was it? Less about a year ago. Maybe it says here, like the last one was like 48 weeks ago, but you guys have been around for a few years now. And right? yeah, yeah. We, we've been around for a long time. I mean, I think I originally incorporated in 2011. Um, and then we didn't really launch the app until 2015. We just were just building for a number of years and kind of researching and, and taking our time with it. And then, so yeah, 2015 is when we launched the first mobile app. And then, you know, since then we've had a handful of, of different waves of growth aligning with different mass movements, really. Like the, our first wave was when the whole NSA surveillance scandal blew up and Snowden came out and anonymous and all this privacy conversation. And so we got like a quarter million users then. And then, you know, basically since then in conjunction with different censorship that's happened on, on big tech networks and, uh, scandals. I mean, just last week we got like two over 200,000 new users from Thailand because there was, uh, basically they were upset about Twitter's new privacy policy and data sharing system with their government. And, um, there's like this whole meme war going on called the milk tea Alliance where people are criticizing, you know, it has to do with like Hong Kong and Taiwan and China. And basically uh, these other countries are memeing China, you know, trying to give credibility to these as like sovereign countries and you know china chinese authorities are not happy about it and so i don't know and it seems like facebook and twitter are um taking down content that you know the the those governments are are at, or the chinese government is asking them to take down and so yeah it's it's crazy i mean the 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 shifts can happen really really quickly and to be honest we haven't even really been able to to handle uh the growth I mean, in, in terms of like servers were okay, like a couple of a little, little blips, but like the big thing right now we're working on is translations. Mm. I mean, because a Angular actually has been slow in, in making uh, runtime translations so that it's all localized to every different area. So like for the past week, we've had like all these like mines TH and like all these Thai hashtags trending. And so everyone's like, what the fuck? Like, um, <laughs> well, that's, so, great. Wrote, that's like, would you ever use an app that was only Chinese? Right. Yeah. Uh, but it's great to hear though, like when bad things happen in the world in terms of, uh, the media or their government, uh, minds goes up. All right. I think that's every time <laughs> I think you can, you can bet on that. I mean, I think in the long run, I mean, uh, there's this book I read in the Taleb, uh, black Swan. And, you know, you talk about like overnight, you can get a ton of users. And I think that's, that'll be the reason ultimately that, um, you know, a social network like mines explodes, but just because there's going, there'll eventually be, too many riots or too many protests or something or other. And you'll have to move your activity over to something else because the NSA has decided that they're co-opting Facebook or something like that, you know? Right. It is possible. You know, I was kind of coming off a little bit skeptical and I think it's good to be skeptical. I, I don't think we should naively say that, Oh, you know, we're just going to make Facebook irrelevant and they're just going to disappear. Like th that's just a little bit too cocky. Um, but I, I mean, you're totally right, man. I mean, it, you know, not just hundreds of thousands of users. I mean, one story that I, I really liked, even though it's a sketchy app, uh, when Pokemon Go went viral, they got like 300 million users within like days. <laughs> like that's 
nuts. And there was, remember, like people were just like running around outside <laughs> and like herds, like trying to find the Pokemon. It looks like a bunch of zombies running everywhere. I was one of those zombies. <laughs> 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 I only collect Abras. Um, Did you have it? Yeah, I have it. I, oh, yeah. the, I have. Uh, I still have the app and. Yeah. Thing I have, I have like just 200 Abra. So those are the only thing I collect. It's, mm. Yeah, I don't really care for, for the rest of them. Um, so what you're saying is when you finally go public, that's the time to buy some mine stock, right? Well, actually, we're, we're, we're already quasi-public and we're going to be um, doing another equity crowdfunding round this year. So we already have like almost 2,000 users who own stock. And... So yeah, because we did what's called a, a Reg CF regulation crowdfunding, which is new new um, in the U.S., which allows for both accredited and non-accredited investors to get involved in in startups. It used to be as a startup you could only raise from accredited investors; otherwise, there was liability for non-accredited. So that's so they let you raise up to a million, and but now we're I you know not a hundred percent, but most likely going to be doing what's called a Reg A plus which allows you to raise much more and from more people. And we, yeah, we're going to be, we're going to be pushing it hard. We want to have as many of our users like own stock as possible because that's just how it should be. Oh, dude. I, I, we always hear these stories like, man, if I was only, if I just had a Google stock when it first came out or <laughs> had Apple stock, uh, or if I just bought Bitcoin when it was 20 cents uh, and we see like the way of, uh, encryption and security being valued more and more. Yeah, I see mine to be a, entirely a, like a good direction of where things should be going uh, and a great place to invest. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you have you, we have you on here to talk more to that and it makes me actually <laughs> learn more about mines and the problems with Facebook during, during my research. And like, for example, like you have like Facebook does shut down users like in China and other places around the country. Uh, they will shut down your account. They will comply with uh, communist China. Um, how hard would it be would it for communist China to force you to comply or to shut down or delete? It can't force us. I mean, we're not going to comply. What what will we actually just got banned uh, last week from the Chinese app store? <laughs> so, there you go. Uh, maybe that's a badge of honor. <laughs> <laughs> that on the tagline. <laughs> From China. <laughs> I know. Put it in our footer as like a little, <laughs> little badge. But yeah, I mean, it's gonna get it's gonna get squirrely and we're gonna get pressured. And you know, I think ultimately it's just not worth it to bow because people can use VPNs, you know, people it doesn't matter where you are, like you can you can find a way. I mean, people in China, they're all figuring out ways to get on Facebook and whatnot. Even though, I mean, Facebook is banned in China. Google is banned in China. That's how bad China is that, you know, those sites, you know, don't even go nearly far enough for China. So, you know, sometimes we, you know, get into our own little bu bubble. It's really terrifying to think about that, how locked down things are in China and North Korea. I mean, just total information lockdown. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. So, and I, I think decentralized networks will be resilient to that. Right. I think um, what you're doing in terms of that, like I guess that's some some of the problems that people have. I think that was like the problem, like the uh, the Iranian revolution that they were having a couple of years ago, and how quickly like, people took to Twitter, but then like how quickly kind of Twitter kind of turn against them. Um, yeah. And that's why, you know, even to the point in some countries where they'll shut down the internet entirely. And so some, there have been some really cool peer to peer apps where it doesn't even actually require internet. It just uses like Bluetooth and stuff so that people can still message each other locally in like a certain geography without even without in it, without internet access, which is amazing. I mean, that I would love to build in, I'm really interested in the local localization tools and, and helping people communicate. Like I would love to have that feature so that you could just message with people like in your, you know, immediate vicinity without even internet. That's awesome. 
That's have so you cool. heard of have you heard of IPFS yet? Inter- IPFS, yeah. We've been yeah, we've been playing with it. Um it's a little bit slow sometimes. Right. But it's very cool. Yeah, it's like a dis- totally distributed system. So I think that's the future. I think it's coming. It's just it's a steamroller. It's n- inevitable, but it's uh it's coming down the pike. Exactly. Exactly. And so you gotta you gotta play with it. You gotta wait for the transactions to process. I mean, you know, even Bitcoin is, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's holding strong, but it's still, you know, kind of slow, uh, expensive blockchains generally are, but you know, the crazy thing is that even, you know, with that being the case, it's still just such a brilliant feat. I just like the, the fact that, no one knows who Satoshi is that is it you <laughs> I wish they love uh, tell us <laughs> but I mean that's just such a beautiful thing that just like a uh, it it just emerged so naturally and like no one knows who created it it's totally self governing self growing it's just it's like an organism it's really crazy yeah. So, um, my last question is, uh, coming up, wrapping up is, um, you're kind of like Mr. Universe from, uh, Serenity and, uh, trying to boost the signal. <laughs> I, I don't know what Serenity is. Do I need to, it's a great show about people who make their own way independently against, uh, uh, space tyranny, uh, nice. first governments, uh, actually part of the monstrous government is actually like in the future where China and with maybe America just converge together and just kind of uh, stomp down on freedom. So this ragtag team of groups of people are trying to fight back against that. Nice. Where, can, where is it? Where can I watch it? Uh, Serenity is uh, named Firefly. You've heard of Firefly. Mm-hmm. Maybe so Serenity is the movie that they made after the series to kind of put it all together. Okay. Uh, and to kind of wrap it up. And uh, there's this guy who's a tech genius who's about boosting the signal and giving people the information that they need. And uh, th- your response is to like, if the Chinese government is trying to come after, like we're not complying. It's like, they just have to shut us down like they just did. Um, so my question would be, um, eventually, Minds, the movie will come out. Who gets to play you? I don't know. Who do I look like? <laughs> any, any, any celebrity doppelgangers that you can think of? Um, that's a tough one. Who would be good? I mean, Michael Fassbender just did, uh, uh he did. <laughs> no, well he did Steve jobs. Uh, and he's, <laughs> he's a little too old. Um, and Steve jobs is funny because, you know, obviously uh, this guy, Eben Moglin has a great quote about Steve jobs. Eben, Eben is, uh, started the software freedom law center. He's a, uh, lawyer, Columbia professor, like just internet freedom pioneer. And he says that Steve Jobs was a brilliant artist, um, but a moral monster. Mm. And I think that that is just so true because, you know, every, all Apple stuff is beautiful and it, it's smooth and it, it, and it works, but it's just dirty. And, and, and the, you know, the tactics that these, you know, it used to be, you know, Bill Gates and, and Steve jobs. And now it's Zuckerberg and Dorsey and, you know, the Google guys, they're, they're just ruthless. And it's just that, the, so the web two companies are just, you know, the next generation of ruth, ruthless Silicon Valley pirates, you know, they like to call the free software people pirates, but really they're the pirates. Agreed. So, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have an answer for your, for your, your, <laughs> Question I guess like Michael, Michael Fassbender. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good, John. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the show with us uh, on the Libertarian Crusader Show. Uh, really appreciate your time uh, and our conversation that we had with you. Hope everyone that's watching uh, to set up an account on minds.com. It's very easy. I set one up uh, less than a year ago and it's still there. And it's something that I'm going to start using more actively. Yeah, let's uh, let's definitely sh- share this out on there, and yeah, hit me up after. Shoot me all your your usernames, and and let's make sure to connect and follow up. Yes. <laughs> With those watching, uh, stay liberated. Get off my property. Print guns, not money. Mm-hmm.